All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to introduce our seminar speaker for today, Sean Carroll. Uh, I will point out if you're here expecting to hear about wormholes or atheism, uh, that's the wrong Sean Carroll, and now's a good time to sneak out. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you're in for a treat. Uh, Dr. Carroll is now a distinguished pre professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, he's written many books on evolution and the uh, diversity of form, which are great books and you should buy them. Uh, you, you can pay me later for that. And uh, he's also uh, uh, an award-winning television and movie producer. So uh, he's even uh, been nominated for an Oscar. So that's what we're, we're really gonna hear about is his Oscar. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, he is one of the, and uh, I saw him talk when I was uh, much younger, uh, and he's really one of the great communicators of uh, science of evolution and uh, developmental biology. So you're in for a treat, and I'm just gonna let him talk instead of me. Please come up and welcome Sean Carroll. Well, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the folks who spent time with me. Uh, during the day. Uh, thanks for all of you tuning in, wherever you may be. Uh, I hope there's a little something um, for everyone in this talk. It's, uh, we're going to roam over a little bit of territory. Um, so I'm going to make a quick amendment to the title. This, this is, uh, it'll make sense later, but maybe it's the sort of teaser that will make some of you stick around. Um, but you know, today I'm going to talk about the scientific ideas that have um, my lab's been pursuing for, for quite some time. Um, but I also want to take a moment to acknowledge why we do what we do. I just had a discussion with several um, young scientists here, and it's only fair that I sort of uh, say why I do what I do. Um, our personal motivations and inspirations as, as biologists, I think we actually um, talk about this too rarely. And I think that the writer Albert Camus, who I some years ago spent a lot of time with, at least sort of in spirit, captured a general truth about creative lives when he said that, and please forgive the gender bias, this was written 80 years ago, um, a person's work is nothing but uh, this slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great and simple images in whose presence their heart first opened. And for me, um, those images are these creatures. Um, I think it was these animals. I actually owned a um, speckled king snake like the one on the left. Um, but it was their beautiful spotted and striped pattern that inspired my interest in biology, my interest in pattern formation, and my love um, for the animal kingdom, which continues to this day. That picture was taken in June at a sanctuary in, in South Africa. Um, but before I could uh, you know, if I had a hope of someday making a living studying or even helping these animals, um, I, I, I first had to study things that were a bit smaller <laughs> and uh, largely indoors. Um, but I've tried to ask a big question, and a big question in evolutionary biology is the origins of novelty. And you think about novelties, and the elephant's trunk is a great example of that. Um, you know, way back to Darwin's time, one of the hardest things for evolutionary uh, science to explain was the origin of anything, and particularly the origin of something with a new function, because if that was assembled um, through intermediate stages, which is really the description of, of a, a lot of evolutionary science, you know, what good were those intermediate stages? So um, it's, it's been a fundamental uh, challenge, and it's, it's, of course, central to evolutionary thought of, of trying to explain where new things come from. So this has occupied my lab for more than 20 years. And what I mean by tracking the origins of novelty, um, I'm biased towards a genetic description, um, so traits, either, either anatomical or biochemical traits. And what we're really saying is how from some ancestral structure or molecule, through what series of steps does a, a novelty uh, emerge into the world? And um, so there's a how, and there's also importantly, and I think underappreciated, a why. All, all of us involved in experimental biology, biomedicine, we're really into the how. How does this work? How does this piece of machinery work? What are the molecules? What are the genes behind it, um, et cetera? And that's the same for me from an evolutionary motivation. What specifically, for example, are the genetic steps that occur in the assembly of a novelty? 
and in what order, and the order becomes interesting for certain reasons. But also, the sort of underappreciated side of this is why these steps and this order and not others. In other words, are there particular paths that evolution is more inclined to take, either because certain steps are more probable, or maybe they're more permissible under, for example, natural selection, or maybe they're necessary. You can't even get there without taking a certain kind of step. So today I'm going to address two different kinds of novelties. I'm just going to sort them into um, and talk about genetic changes that underlie the origins of both new morphologies, in other words, little pieces of form, pattern and form, physical form, and the second um, deals with protein functions. Now, one of the biggest influences on thinking about the genetic source of novelty was a book written, I know for all the young scientists, you're thinking, oh my god, this guy is going back into the dark ages, but um, yeah, I am. Um, but it was a great book, and if you've never read it and you're at all interested in evolution, this is one of the part of the canon that you should know about. And it was Susumu Ono's book in 1970 called Evolution by Gene Duplication. And uh, Ono, this is kind of the first really concrete piece of writing trying to explain where, you know, where did new things come from. And right in the preface and in the introduction of the book, Ono states his case when he said that natural selection merely modified while redundancy created. So he thought that redundancy was a necessary element to, to uh, invention, to, to novelty, and argued that allelic mutations of already existing gene loci cannot account for major changes in evolution. And a few years later, two other great um, uh, Japanese evolutionary biologists sort of doubled down on Ono's view and stated that gene duplication must always precede the emergence of a gene having a new function. Now, anyone here, anyone listening to this talk that has spent any time in a genome knows that gene duplication is a pretty prevalent phenomenon, or at least the results of gene duplication are pretty prevalent. Um, so that, that fact, which has been known for a long, long time, even before there were genomes, um, has guided a lot of thinking. Oh, well, we see duplication, and we see duplication associated with noon function. So therefore, the thought was that this was a necessary step. Now, you would think that 50 years later, with all of our powers of genomic analysis, throughout the tree of life, we'd understand the rule of gene duplication and the evolution of novelty. But interestingly, I'll assert, we don't. Collectively, we might have more misunderstanding than understanding. So I hope in the course of today's talk, I don't make that situation any worse. Um, but rather, I'm going to hope you're going to come away with some fresh, maybe even a deeper appreciation of some of the issues, and one or two concrete resolutions. Now, the expectation that gene duplication played a necessary role, and that was the expectation that I was baptized into when I started early work um, in the evolution of development. That was definitely the, the framework um, for really at least two decades, until perhaps around the mid-1990s, when in the study of the evolution of development in animal form, a body of work revealed that this view was not correct. Um, and a wonderful first clue arrived unexpectedly in my lab in, uh, in the, this form. So I was showing you, this is this little bit of nostalgia today. We're going to go back in time a little bit. And what I'm showing you is, um, on the left, immunofluorescence labeling of the imaginal disks, larval imaginal disks of two different species of butterflies labeled with a particular antibody. And you can see that this antibody is lighting up just thousands of cells out here at the periphery of this developing wing of a monarch butterfly, and also thousands of cells at the periphery of the developing wing of this East African butterfly. But in addition to those cells, you can see an intense pattern of expression, a high level of expression in the centers of each of these divisions of the developing butterfly wing. So this one has this general pattern, and this one has this general, superimposed on this general pattern, are seven new spots where the gene is deployed. Um, and I guess I don't think the animation of this is going to work, so that's, a, that's just a close up of that. And those seven spots correspond precisely to the white pupils, you can say, in these eye spots that are on the butterfly wing. These eye spots are used in predator avoidance. They sort of draw the attention of predators away from the main body, where all the organs and juices are, out towards the wing, where the butterfly can withstand a certain degree of tissue loss without too much compromise. 
So these eye spots are important to, a, to an ecological strategy. And they are a novelty um, invented in, uh, in butterflies. So we're you know, very interested in this. And so when we saw that we had, a, uh, had identified a protein product that was expressed in these developing eye spots, we were really excited. But what made us particularly excited was the identity of this gene that we were lighting up in butterflies. Because we knew we learned a bit about that gene about the same time, about its deployment across the entire animal kingdom. And what's shown here using a variety of technologies is the labeling of a bunch of different kinds of embryos for this gene called distillus, the protein products of the gene called distillus. And this is the fruit fly in the upper left, and that's a butterfly embryo larva in the, in the middle panel, and that's a brine shrimp on the far right, and this is a developing sea urchin and a kinoderm embryo here close to me. And this is a, a polychaete annelid worm in the fifth panel, and that's a developing chicken wing bud in the next to last panel, and then a, uh, for Sean, a fish fin bud. So um, this gene has been used in the building of appendages throughout the animal kingdom, and based on this distribution, um, for at least 500 million years. So the significance of seeing it in the butterfly, the reason why we got excited, is that this tells us that, and something's not clicking, let's see if we got this. I got a signal on the, on the console here. Is there something that is, all right, hopefully this is gonna continue. Any reason why this would stop advancing? Oh, now it decided to advance. So it hung up there, there we go. We're all right. But there was a message on the board, not for me, hopefully, and um, it kind of froze things up. Okay, so simply put, what this told us was that distillus appears to have acquired a new job in addition to building appendages for 500 million years, which it also does in the, in the fruit fly and butterfly, that had been co-opted into making butterfly color patterns. So that's an important word in evolutionary lingo. So let's be clear, what co-option means is the new use for something that was pre-existing. Could be a trait, okay? So if you think about, for example, bird wings, they've co-opted the tetrapod forelimb into making wings. Well, butterflies have co-opted um, distillus into making spots. But this applies to proteins, genetic elements, what have you. So this first investigation of the butterfly spots um, taught us something that would turn out to be, and we had no idea in the day or year that this first happened, that this would turn out to be a general rule about the evolution of development and form. And I really like general rules, so I'm just gonna put it here as a general rule for Evo, for the evolution of development, is that new patterns evolve when old genes learn new tricks, when existing genes pick up new jobs. And we'll talk in more molecular detail what, what I mean by that, but just for shorthand, we'll call it a new trick. Now, we could not have known that this one finding would anticipate so much of what was to come in the study of the evolution of development. Um, this list was a leading example of a critical and unexpected discovery concerning developmental regulatory genes. And that has to do with the multiple functions or pleiotropy of individual genes. So, this list may not be familiar, that familiar to all of you, but I'll come up with another example, the very famous sonic hedgehog gene. So once it was cloned in the mid-1990s and people looked around at where the gene was deployed, they could see it in the developing, this is in a chicken, they could see it in the developing limb bud where it's known famously for patterning the digits, the developing neural tube, or later, for example, in the development of the feather buds. So, what do these three tissues think now as embryologists, what do these three tissues have in common? Correct, nothing, okay, nothing at all. There's no reason anyone would predict that sonic hedgehog would be involved in the patterning or development of the limb bud, the neural tube, the feather buds, no reason whatsoever. But this pattern was observed again and again by developmental geneticists that individual, in this case a signaling protein, part of an important regulatory pathway, or transcriptional regulators, were involved in the development and patterning of a wide variety of tissues. And that, to some of us thinking about evolution, had immediate evolutionary implications. The implications of this gene pleiotropy, these multi multifunctional um, genes and proteins, were that clearly individual regulatory genes have acquired potentially many new roles in the course of evolution, but without gene duplication. That's one sonic hedgehog locus, that in the fruit fly or butterflies, one distillus locus, multiple jobs, 
encoded by a gene at one locus. That means that to pick up those jobs over the course of the evolution of the animal kingdom, gene co-option must be widespread. But what we had no evidence for was how exactly did co-option occur. So we were arguing that co-option was really important. We were arguing that evolution must be proceeding by using these genes again and again in new ways. How are we going to figure out how co-option occurs? Well, I wish I could show you that data from a butterfly, but we learned pretty quickly that butterflies weren't going to be nearly as tractable as some other organisms that we were um, working out the developmental regulatory mechanics in. And so we dropped back to working with a little more familiar and malleable creatures like this one, who nonetheless had turned out to be, I'd say, a reasonable analog, not as pretty, I know, not as pretty as a butterfly eye spot, but had a spot on its wing and that we thought we could understand genetically and molecularly what was going on. So um, this is two species of fruit flies, a Drosoph the familiar Drosophila melanogaster on the top, uh, Drosophila biarmapase on the bottom, not a, very di a fairly close relative of Drosophila melanogaster. And the males of this species and a handful of others in the same group um, display a dark spot on the uh, anterior distal part of their wing that seems to be involved in a courtship display. I didn't bring the video just as well. It wouldn't have played. Um, and so what we try to do, and, and you know, part of the, the art of our business of science is to find the simplest example of the phenomenon you want to understand. So if, I guess I'll put it this way, if, if you know, beta-galactosidase beta beta synthesis was you know, the model for prokaryotic gene regulation, well, for uh, the evolution of a piece of anatomy, it's our little two-dimensional dark smudge on a wing um, that, that was our model. And the us in that, in that plural uh, was Nicola Gompel, uh, Benjamin Prudhomme and Tricia Whitcop were all in my lab, um, overlapping at one point, and have worked to, to dissect this. And then I'm going to so show you some subsequent work from Nicholas and Benjamin in a, in a second. Now, I'm not going to walk you through the data. This is long published work. I'm kind of setting you up for the second part of the talk. Um, I'm just going to walk through the model. Again, you can, you can look at all the evidence. I'm just trying to build a picture in your mind of how might new patterns of gene expression evolve without any process of duplication or anything like that, because that's what appears to have happened based on our analysis of the regulatory elements and transcription factors involved in making this pattern. So if you wanted to walk you through the model, imagine, maybe don't look at the screen yet, imagine in a developing wing all sorts of transcription factors deployed in all sorts of patterns that are involved in shaping that wing which means you know, putting the veins in the right place and putting sensory structures in the right place and defining the front edge and the back edge and the outer edge and the inner edge of the wing and the top surface and the bottom surface, all that kind of stuff. So sort of cryptically to yours and my eye on a Drosophila wing, there's all sorts of transcription factors de deployed in all sorts of patterns. And then imagine there's also genes, which there are, that are involved in a pigmentation pathway and actually when expressed uh, make the dark melanin pigment. Um, and now imagine some connection between those transcription factors that pattern the overall wing and a gene involved in making pigmentation pattern. And that's what happened. The gene is called yellow. Just think of it as a black paintbrush, OK? It's an enzyme involved in the melanin synthesis pathway. Um, and what's happened is that in the ancestral condition, so sort of represented by Drosophila melanogaster, yellow is expressed at low levels across the wing, just gets it a very sort of light dusting of pigmentation. And there's a regulatory element upstream of the yellow gene that's responsible for that expression. And I've not mastered your pointer here yet because it doesn't work like, there we are. Imagine that regulatory element, OK. So you have sort of a, a pre-pattern of the wing of transcription factors. You have a regulatory element. There's no connection between these transcription factors and this element in melanogaster. But go over here to Drosophila biarmapase. What we discovered was that this regulatory element had a novel activity that drove expression in the anterior distal part of the wing. So something has changed in the regulatory element. And what's changed in that regulatory element is it's acquired binding sites for a couple of transcription factors. And we identified one of the transcription factors right away because one of the obvious features of the pattern of expression of this element was it was excluded from the posterior half of the wing. 
And we knew a transcription factor that, in fact, had that domain of expression. It's a well-known transcription factor. It's been around for a long time, called in GRAIL. This is the transcription factor depicted here in green. And we map binding sites for this in the regulatory element. So one of those inputs, and that's a repressive, uh, a, a negative input, comes from the green protein called in GRAIL. We didn't know the activator for, for a little bit, uh, a little while. But what you can imagine is, imagine the activator, say, drawn here in purple, and the repressor drawn here in green, and those combined inputs into this element would give you a little quadrant of elevated yellow expression. So that's what we think has happened. Hopefully I described that somewhat moderately clearly. So an extant regulatory element, extant transcription factors, all that had to happen was binding sites to arise in the regulatory element for those transcription factors, and now you have a regulatory connection that modulates the expression of the pigmentation gene which gives you the black pattern. Now, what excited us about the identity of that green transcription factor is that the engrailed protein's been around, again, for 500 million years. It's been expressed in the posterior compartments of arthropod and insect segments for all that time. So what you have is a gene, a protein, doing something else for a long time, now being brought into the pathway for modulating the pigmentation of the animal. So this is how new patterns um, can arise. Now, Nicola and Benjamin continue to work on the identity of the activator, and wouldn't you know it, well, we didn't know it, but they figured it out, that the activator is distillus. So here we thought, you know, if you were, if you were underwhelmed by that fruit fly spot as a, as a surrogate for the butterfly eye spot, turns out darn protein involved in making the eye spot is also distillus. So, um, the general point here, having walked you through some of the mechanics, is that really how do new patterns emerge? And these new gene expression patterns, and if they're involved in developmental pathways, new morphologies evolve largely through changes in enhancers, which is the rewiring of these transcriptional regulatory networks. OK, so with respect to gene duplication, the story of the evolution of development and morphology is not one of gene duplication, but of regulatory rewiring among a fable, fairly stable set of regulatory genes. Distillus has been around for a long time, and Grail has been around for a long time. I mean, consider, for example, maybe one, you know, one of my favorite gene complexes, maybe yours. Something like the Hox genes, famous for um, shaping the development along the anterior posterior axis of, of all vertebrates. Um, there are no new Hox genes that evolved in the evolution of, of tetrapod diversity. In fact, a couple have been lost. So if you infer what was existing in the last common ancestor of ourselves with coelacanths and frogs and mice and all that sort of stuff, all that, all that whole complex has been there. And that nothing, no new genes were necessary to shape, for example, um, you know, our fingers and et cetera. All those genes were in place um, in uh, distant fishy ancestors. Uh, of humans. And what I want you to do is to hold this picture in your mind of and contrast this very long term evolutionary stability with the part of the story that I'm about to tell you. Okay. So we're going to switch creatures here. Now, those of you who are sane, when you look at this picture, probably see a dangerous animal that you would like to avoid if you were happen to, to come across it. Um, I see, first of all, I do walk towards these animals, but I also see an irresistible evolutionary mystery. And that's because the snake body plan and venomous snakes in particular display many interesting novelties. First is their limbless body, okay, which means they got rid of their legs, but that allows a, a unique locomotion and habitat. And the rattlesnake, the rattle, forked tongue, and these pit vipers, these infrared sensing pits that, that sense their prey, and when they open their mouth, two more impressive novelties, their fangs, which were a delivery system um, for their venom. So um, several years ago, decided to uh, shift from our exclusive focus on the evolution of pattern and morphology to ask about the evolution of biochemical novelty. And we think that venoms are a great model of biochemical novelty for several reasons. First of all, they are recently evolved, so their invention is pretty accessible in the genetic record. They're a key trait um, for subduing prey. This is obviously how venomous snakes get their meals, so um, a really important weapon. 
It turns out that in any snake venom, that I, every snake venom that I can think of, there are multiple novel proteins. Not necessarily novel to that species, but let's just say that there are members of protein families that are novel in terms of their uh, incorporation into venom. And then um, from an evolutionary point of view, it's very clear that snakes and their prey are in evolutionary arms races. So that's sort of like evolution in, um, on steroids a little bit because uh, both this is how snakes get their meals. And of course, if you're prey, preyed upon by these snakes, any resistance you can evolve to them, whether behavioral or biochemical, um, is, is valuable. So that puts evolution sort of in a, in, in a fast motion. I also mentioned something about recency. I, I don't know if this little factoid would interest you, but snakes are kind of overlooked as a model for anything. And that may have been your first reaction when I said I'm going to talk about snakes. Um, but the reason why there are many reasons why they might be of interest from an evolutionary point of view is that if you just look at the, the pit vipers in the Americas, so we've got things like copperheads and rattlesnakes here. Um, but there are pit vipers throughout the Americas. The la they're, first of all, they're all descended from one uh, common, uh, common ancestor that arrived in the Americas about 24 million years ago. And so this is a very recent radiation of all these snakes, whether it's bushmasters and feridolances or fancy pit vipers that live in the tropics or um, water moccasins, whatever it might be. Um, these, these are all a recently um, diversified set of snakes that arrived from Asia about 24 million years ago. Now, venom, which they use to subdue their prey, now let's frame the biochemical question here, which is, are venom toxins, are they old proteins with a new job, or are they new proteins? Are they you know, something sort of invented um, from scratch? So before you start imagining me you know, throwing students and postdocs into a snake pit, um, I want to acknowledge the, the folks who made this work possible and the, the pioneers who really helped get this off the ground uh, both at Wisconsin and then subsequently as my lab moved to College Park a few years ago are uh, Noel Dowell, who's there in the bright blue shirt, and Matt Giorgiani on the far left. And we got uh, special help um, from the Natural Toxins Research Center, an NIH, NIH funded facility in Kingsville, Texas, from uh, Elda Sanchez and Mark Hockmuller. Um, they handled the dangerous snakes. Um, so, so Noah and Matt didn't have to. And then, especially back at Wisconsin, Victoria Kasner and Sam Griffin and Jane Seelig, who helped get this off the ground. So I'll give you a little, quick little background on rattlesnake venoms. Um, just to tell you that many rattlesnake species, the, their venoms are hemorrhagic. So um, they destroy vascular integrity. Uh, there's, for, in, in, for example, in human bites, there's a lot of necrosis, et cetera. But it's really sort of a collapse of the hemostasis system that's going to be a, a problem for um, the prey. And some are neurotoxic and will cause respiratory arrest really quickly. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about the key toxins and then the genes that encode them. So um, one really important group of toxins for this destruction of vascular integrity are a group of uh, metalloproteinases. So we refer to them as snake venom metalloproteinases. As you'll see in a second, they're very familiar to biologists who've worked on metalloproteinases in vertebrates. Um, these are just zinc-dependent enzymes. Um, and we, so what we did is, is exactly how you would imagine we would tackle this puzzle, which was to go peering into the genomes of these creatures, see how these genes were encoded, and see if we could trace um, whatever we could of their evolutionary history. And when you do that for the venom metalloproteinases, you find all of, say, a Western Diamondbacks metalloproteinases all together in one gene complex, bang, 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 30 genes in a row. So this was convenient that all of these enzymes were encoded in the same place. Um, but you can also appreciate those of you who've either um, analyzed genomes or cloned anything. Um, that's a big complex uh, to analyze and to annotate. But the, the key little evolutionary hint is that all of these um, genes are adjacent to uh, a gene here hiding behind the curtain which I'll try to highlight. Come on, there we go. I'll get a hang of this. Called Adam. Uh, this is, in fact, the Adam 28 gene. That's a gene found in all vertebrates, um, a metalloproteinase. And that's not in the venom of the snake. So every, virtually everything to the right here um, is expressed in the venom of the snake. So 
Clearly what's happened is that this family has been expanded in venomous snakes, and we know that history. We can reconstruct that history by looking at lots of other snake genomes. I just want to draw your attention. So there's been a massive expansion of the venom genes in rattlesnakes of these metalloproteinases from this ancestral Adam-28 locus. And so if you walk through the genome here, you look at, in most, like for example, other reptiles, other vertebrates, this part of the genome is sort of stable. There's not been much action. But then you just have this huge expansion of close to 30 genes um, expanding out from Adam-28. So clearly, um, we understand that all of these snake toxins, uh, metalloproteinase toxins, are descended from a normal physiological protein, uh, Adam-28, and have evolved from this ancestral gene through um, a process of expansion and diversification. And we can see that there's really a couple of steps to this. Uh, one is co-option, because Adam-28 is not expressed in the venom gland. There had to be some evolutionary step that got at least the ancestor of the big, one of the genes of the big complex into, uh, to be expressed in venom gland tissue. And then subsequent, as that subsequently expanded, then those genes were also expressed in the venom gland. So this is to tell you that snake venom and metalloproteinases, and essentially, and I'll show you another example, all venom toxin families are derived from ancestral physiological proteins that have normal roles in vertebrate physiology. And they've been co-opted. They've been brought into the, uh, recruited from other tissues uh, to be expressed in the venom gland. And in the case of the metalloproteinases, which are um, structurally quite diverse, biochemically quite diverse, They've also gone through a, a massive a process of gene duplication and intergenic deletion. So this is a case where at least biochemical diversity of this toxin has been shaped by lots and lots of deletion steps. And I'm just going to show you kind of the forensic details of that a little bit to see that, to just show you there's also, uh, you know, evolution can also create novelty by even whittling things down. So there's been a fair amount of whittling going in this um, family. So these metalloproteinases um, have a really uh, expanded structure. Uh, the Adam-28 gene is something like 25 exons. But if you look at the genes that are used in the venom, they all lack, as you might expect, a transmembrane domain. So the ancestral gene had four domains, a metalloproteinase domain where the active site is for the metalloproteinase activity, a disintegrin domain, shown here in kind of yellow, a cysteine-rich domain, shown here in orange, and the transmembrane domain. And so the ancestral gene, which you can still see in, in, in uh, Western Diamondback rattlesnake genome, has this transmembrane domain. But all of the venom expressed genes, this part of the gene has been deleted. And then there's actually three classes of metalloproteinases, which they call class 3, 2, and 1. Class 3 has all three of these domains, the metalloprotein, disintegrin, and cysteine-rich domain. But the class twos have had an intergenic deletion that's taken out the cysteine-rich domain. And there's a class one family where both, that is actually derived from the class two family, where both the cysteine-rich and the disintegrin uh, domains have been deleted. And so there's actually toxins, which are essentially just a metalloproteinase without any of, this, uh, any of these other biochemical domains. OK, so co-option, bringing this physiological protein into the venom. Um, duplication, and then diversification through this intergenic deletion, duplication and intergenic deletion process. All right, so let's turn to the neurotoxin. So the neurotoxin, uh, which is in a subset of rattlesnakes, this is a heterodimer, consists of two phospholipase A2 subunits, a basic subunit shown here in purple, an acidic subunit shown here in green and orange. Um, this heterodimer is restricted, as I said, to a subset of, of rattlesnakes who so are really interested in its history, um, but it tells a, it, there's a pretty similar story in terms of its evolution. Um, these phospholipase A2 subunits clearly came from uh, a region of the gene that encodes multiple phospholipase A2 proteins, uh, some of which are uh, used elsewhere in physiology, they have nothing to do with the venom, and several of which that have been recruited into venom. And the two neurotoxin subunits I've highlighted here. So for example, this Phospholipase A2 here shown in green, and this one shown here over, sorry, in gray, and this one over here in gray. Um, these have never been expressed in venom. We don't know of them ever being recruited into venom. They're related to the venom expressed genes, but they've, they've not been recruited into this pathway whatsoever. Um, so 
And it's a fairly similar story of, well, how did this gene complex of toxin subunits come together? Similar story to what I told you in terms of the metalloproteinases, in that we know there's a, well, a phospholipase A2 locus shown here, designated G shown here, and traceable uh, easily through uh, reptiles that uh, has re existed in single copy for a long time, but it expanded into multiple genes in the evolution of vipers and uh, pit vipers, their close relatives. So again, it's a story of recruitment into the venom gland and expansion from a single ancestral locus. Now, I told you some of this. Well, I want, what I want to do is, having given you a, a, a picture of this, this is a really different pattern than what I showed you, for example, for the Hox genes or for the regulato other regulatory genes that I told you about, a pretty striking contrast. And that leads me to want to at least gamble a general inference about what kinds of gene duplicates are retained and why. So with respect to gene duplication novelty, this suggests there's kind of different rules for different gene types. And if you think about regulatory genes like Distalis or Sonic Hedgehog or Engrailed or whatever, these duplications are rarely fixed in animals. Now we know from all sorts of studies of mutation that you know, there's all sorts of mutations going on at all times. So we don't think these duplications don't occur. It's just that they're not retained. Now why might that be? And I want to suggest from a variety of well, evidence, I'm not going to get, not, I'll get into some little bit of the evidence, is that dosage of these genes really matters. We know that many of these genes are haploid sufficient. They also have um, phenotypes when present in three copies. So that initial duplication step, even of a wild type gene, can have a phenotype that could be deleterious. So, and because these things are involved in, re in, in regulating networks of genes, and some of them may be regulating hundreds of other genes, simply an extra, one extra copy may imbalance those regulatory networks and, and be deleterious. So the inference we take from that is that because these duplications in these regulatory genes seem to be fixed rarely, you could think of exceptions, um, they're constrained due to dosage effects on the expression of other genes, and that these duplicates would actually be selected against. Contrast that with, and I'm sure you have your favorite gene families, um, duplications may be numerous, I mean, olfactory receptors, immunoglobulin genes, et cetera. They're unconstrained, no effect on the expression of other genes. They're generally expressed in terminal cell types, right? So they don't have these pleiotropic effects. They don't have the constraint that exists on regulatory genes. And therefore, duplicates could be selected for. There's a reason I'm putting the question mark there, but I'm just going to stop for a second and, and let first this contrast sink in, and then in the last part of the talk, take you through a little conundrum. So while this contrast is empirically supported, and you can quibble with it as much as you like, but it's empirically supported, it raises a conundrum that I want to explore and try to make at least a partial solution in the, in the remainder of the talk. And this is the conundrum. Ever since the time of Ono and, and sort of the embrace of this idea of gene duplication being a, either a necessary or a common participant in the evolution of novelty, um, that, was, that was such a, a, a prevalent um, mindset. Uh, only some decades later did particularly popul population geneticists start to raise their hand and say, um, there's a little problem with this model. And the problem is, that duplication does not necessarily lead to innovation, nor is the presence of a duplicate evidence of any new function or even of natural selection having acted. And, and here's why. Because since a duplicate is initially identical, it may be redundant. And then it would be neutral, and we know from the rules of population genetics that that would usually be lost or fixed only rarely by genetic drift. And even if it's fixed, it's more likely, it's more probable to experience an inactivating mutation, something, for example, that would mess up the open reading frame, shift the reading frame, whatever it might be, than it is an innovative mutation. Because the innovative mutations that would give a protein novel activity, those are going to occur in precise places in that reading frame. Those are going to be relatively rare mutations relative to mutations that could disrupt the protein. So this is the, this is the conundrum. And the question, is there any way to sort of get around this. So it became appreciated that 
the fates of gene duplicates are not simply the middle scenario, which was sort of favored in, 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 in a lot of thinking, which was if, if you duplicate a gene, now you've got a spare copy you can play with, and you play with that copy and go through, uh, make something novel out of it, a process called neo-functionalization. Now, the, the statistical argument is that it's much more likely that two other things are going to happen, which is the other copy is going to get inactivated, for example, a, something that disrupts the coding region, which I'm, I should point out I'm applying in this, denoting in this yellow segment. Or another common fate would be that if the gene has multiple regulatory elements, that basically you'll have decay, you'll have mutations in, say, a regulatory element that affects expression in one tissue, and in the other copy maybe mutations in a regulatory element affects expression in another tissue. And now basically you have two copies of a gene that together just do the same thing the original gene did. So you've gone through sub-functionalization. You've essentially divided the ancestral functions with two copies of the genes, but biologically nothing's really changed. So we could be fooled in looking in genomes when we see, say, two copies of a gene. Oh, something interesting has gone on. No, you can certainly explain the existence of gene duplicates through a, a sub-functionalization process where really nothing has changed about. Now, now the ancestral functions are just divided by the two copies of the gene. So this process, which excites evolutionary biologists the most, neo-functionalization, that's hard to explain. OK? So are there evolutionary forces that can surmount this conundrum? I'll just give you a second to think about that. Um, well, it turns out, so you know, we were, as we're starting to face this, and we're seeing this massive expansion of gene families, and we know these toxins are really important in subduing prey, and we're thinking, ah, this, is, you know, this can't just be you know, a, a neutral mechanism. Something's got to be going on. Um, elsewhere in the lab, quite unexpectedly, a different project gave us, I think, the insight that helps us think our way through this. And it's, in fact, alcohol, or at least flies that like alcohol, that catalyzed two entirely unexpected discoveries and spurred our rethinking about gene duplication that I think will, will, will help you through this. So this is a project uh, initiated by uh, David Lowland when he was a postdoc in my lab. Now he's at, at Williams College. And David's goal, David was really interested in uh, tackling quantitative evolution. That you can imagine that throughout the evolution of the physiology of all sorts of organisms, for example, how much of a protein or how much of an enzyme activity you make in something could be really important. And it just hadn't really been tackled at a deep level of how are all the different ways that one can tinker with the uh, quantitative activity at a given locus. And one of the famous fruit fly genes for evolutionary geneticists and, in fact, a really well-studied enzyme is the alcohol dehydrogenase gene in protein. And alcohol dehydrogenase is important to fruit flies because fruit flies live in these fermenting habitats, and, they have, and many species have to tolerate a certain amount of alcohol um, in their environment. And what's shown here, um, schematically in the bar graph is um, the amount of alcohol dehydrogenase activity in a whole bunch of different species of fruit flies and color-coded with the habitats that those fruit flies uh, inhabit, some of which, for example, have adapted to human habitats like breweries and wine cellars, or they live out in the wild on decaying plant matter um, or, for example, um, rotting fruit. And what David thought was, if I looked in detail at Pairs of species, very recently slightly diverged species that had big differences in, in uh, alcohol dehydrogenase activity, maybe I could map all of the molecular contributions to that divergence and understand in general how does something like an, uh, a gene encoding an enzyme like this, how does this evolve uh, in an animal? How does the quantitative uh, uh, levels of this enzyme activity evolve? And you can imagine lots of questions, I mean, lots of possibilities. You could evolve specific activity differences, so coding changes in the enzyme. You could evolve um, regulatory differences at the transcriptional level, regulatory differences at the translational level, et cetera. So what David did is, is because this is such a well-studied system, he also knew he, could be, he wanted to be able to quantitate very small differences, and he wanted to use the power of Drosophila genetics to do this in a really controlled way where he could, for example, put the ADH loci of any fruit fly into the same spot in the genome and so that everything was you know, extremely well controlled, able to measure, uh, and, and to see what the genetic basis was, molecular basis was of this phenotypic diversity. And it's a small gene, small enough gene that he could do all the transgenics um, that he would like. 
And in the course of that study, he made one observation that is, is the, uh, what I want to highlight today. And that was he found that a, a fruit fly that was really adapted to a brewery environment relative to its uh, more wild cousin, Drosophila virilis, uh, had experienced a duplication of the alcohol dehydrogenase locus. So of all of the parts of the gene that were evolving that he mapped in all these pair of species, one of these, uh, in one of these cases, there had been a duplication of, AD, of ADH. And that's such a recent duplication that there are only like two amino acid differences between the two, pair, uh, the two copies of the gene, and he could do all the proper controls of changing those amino acids back, et cetera, et cetera. So the differences in ADH activity were not due to any protein changes. It was due to copy number. And because and part of his, his technology here was to be able to reintroduce these genes and quantitatively measure differences in the activity of the ADH genes from different sources, put them in at the same place in Drosophila melanogaster in all these cases. Um, he was just doing this as a routine experiment. And I just want to tell you that you, know, you can do a routine experiment with really routine expectations, and sometimes you get surprised, particularly if you measure things carefully. And the surprise was that again and again, when he put in the fearless version that was tandemly duplicated, um, he always got more than two-fold activity than with one copy of either of those ADH genes. Now, I'll just say it's all published. He did all sorts of controls you'd think of, um, and including making constructs with other sorts of genes. But it turns out he found reproducibly a greater than two-fold effect of genes being in tandem. So even if you had two copies that were in trans, they, didn't, they had essentially twice as much activity as one copy. But two copies in cis of ADH and of constructs that he made, of reporters and all sorts of other things, um, consistently had more than double the activity. So it looks like the overactivity, in other words, one and one does not make two. One and one can make more than two. The overactivity comes from tandem structure of the genes. And he, this observation has now been supported by uh, studies in a, in a bunch of other species. But, and that's, and that's, I'll just say that's kind of like, I mean, I'm just being, you know, I'm just telling you about that data because it might interest you. Um, it's unexpected. It's worth investigating, and David's been investigating it. But the other thing I want to underscore is he mapped all sorts of contributors to differences in ADH activity. A couple of, a couple of cases of coding changes, those were very, 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 very rare. It looks like you know, that's, this, opt, this enzyme is basically optimized for specific activity. He mapped things in three prime UTRs, five prime UTRs in upstream sequences, et cetera. But the greatest quantitative effect he, he measured in all these species comparisons was due to this duplication. So if you think about making a lot more ADH to live in a very alcohol-rich environment, the single largest mutational step essentially was duplication of the ADH gene. And because we saw that there was no difference between the two in, in the activity of the two paralogs of the ADH gene, no coding differences that were meaningful, we had a little slap the forehead moment because this fruit fly lives in a high alcohol environment. This duplication gives it a lot more ADH activity. And we said, wait a second, this is a case where selection has probably selected for greater enzyme activity, for making more ADH. And we thought, oh, wait a second. So this is what we've been not thinking about in this step here, that duplication happens. And the worry, the population genetic worry, is that this second copy will be lost due to drift. It'll be inactivated by other sorts of mutations, okay? That there's nothing keeping this second copy around long enough to play with it, unless there's selection for increased dosage. And you think about proteins, including things like venom toxins, where there might be selection for making more of something. Because, for example, if you make more of a particular toxin, you might take down your prey uh, more readily. Or if you make more antifreeze, that may, might insulate you more from the cold. Think, think about your favorite sorts of proteins. So this little um, <laughs> unexpected gift from uh, another lab bay, actually in the, in the same lab, made, the, made, it, made us all pay attention that we probably had just not been thinking through uh, this, this issue nearly well enough that simply, if the duplicate can be selected for, for making more protein, then it's going to stick around. And then, you know, we're really excited. 
Always go back and read your original references, kids, because Ono had it. Okay? We're thinking, you know, that Ono was too caught up with neo-functionalization, and all of Owen's, Ono's descendants have all been thinking about gene duplication being necessary. But right there on page 59 in this book in 1970, he wrote the duplication for the sake of producing more of the same. And knew at the time things like histones were present in multi-gene copies, and ribosomal RNA was present in multiple copies, and thought if a cell needs a lot of something, well, duplication is just for making a lot more of the same. <laughs> 50 years and we discover what he already knew. Okay, so um, it makes sense for venom proteins which are highly expressed. And so when we see other situations in genomes like this, so one of my favorite stories are, are for example, antifreezes in polar fish. So if you look at something like the ice fish which lives in the uh, southern ocean off Antarctica, it makes really high levels of an antifreeze protein in its blood. Um, so that it can live in actually sub-freezing waters, waters that are um, below zero degrees Celsius uh, seawater. When you see a battery of genes like this, you know, we don't think that these antifreezes are distinguished at all one from the other. This is just essentially a protein factory. You gotta make a lot of antifreeze. There's only probably so much product you can milk out of, well, I shouldn't use milk because that's another good example. Uh, there's only so much product you can get out of one gene and that this battery enables you essentially to have a factory uh, for making large amounts of stuff. And you see the same sort of thing, for example, it uses antifreeze to, to protect its eggs um, in the waters. But there's more and more cases you can think about this. Even, for example, this might be the case of things like salivary amylases in humans um, that have been amplified, that have been uh, expanded in the course of, of human evolution. So, a little bit of rethinking of gene duplication. I think we can say it's unnecessary for morphological evolution in animals and potentially selected against in most circumstances. But if quantitative effect is biologically significant, then the duplicate can be retained intact, fixed by selection, and set the stage for later innovations, whatever that might be um, in, the, in a biochemical pathway, in an enzymatic pathway, uh, et cetera. Thanks for listening. That last picture was another novelty, but um, some novelties you just want to hold. You don't want to really investigate. That was a pangolin in, in South Africa, for those of you that are fond of um, rare mammals. How do we do questions, Sean? People can come up to the mic, or there's some online storage. And then we get, we get them, there are folks on Zoom, is that right? So okay. Yeah, so Brahmin can has got his eyes on if there's coming in. So my question. So you have, in the case of venomous snakes, the, the duplication of a single type of gene and uh, radiation from that. Uh, so how do you see things like the cone snail venoms, which are crazy cocktails of all kinds of different short peptides? Yeah, evolving? I think in those cases, those, those look like kind of novel polypeptides. Like, I mean, in some cases, like there's, in, there's some insulin, like there's a beautiful story of an insulin-like peptide uh, that's uh, evolved and, and is associated with a dietary switch in the cone snails. But I think some of those short peptides, um, and I wish there were more genomics on these creatures. Last I knew, I don't think cone snails had, sorry, I apologize to everybody, cone snail fans, but last we looked, or last I looked, there wasn't much there. What we want to do is track the origin of these things in the genome. I think they're hard, you know, if they, clearly if they evolve to it, if they are related to an existing protein family, that's not so hard to spot. But what you really want to do is track them, their origin in the genome. And are they just, for example, a little ORF, right? There's all sorts of things. At the size of some of those peptides, they could easily be another reading frame to another protein, right? And if there's some way to just make that stuff and it has any kind of biological activity, you're off and running. Um, so I think it's possible that some short venom toxins are going to be truly sort of de novo polypeptides. What I want to just elaborate on there for a second is the first step in making a new toxin. And uh, I gloss, I mean, I, I've inferred and I've made the argument that there's co-option, right? At some point, something gets into the venom gland and you're off and running, okay? What, we ha what I haven't told you is I really haven't 
giving you any kind of glimpse of what that step looks like because I, I can't. Empirically, we just don't have the evidence yet. It's all, it's all inference that it happens. But realize we think that you know, if, if it's a metalloproteinase, if it's um, a phospholipase A2, that even a normal physiological protein with no modification, simply if expressed in a venom gland and injected into prey, may be toxic, even if that protein is itself obviously a normal physiological protein. So we don't think that these proteins necessarily need to go under any modification to be toxins. That if, there's, if, that if for example, atom 28 or some piece of atom 28 was expressed in the venom gland, that that would suffice to give you enough activity that now selection can start working on that and make a better and better um, a toxin or, or toxin family. And the reason we say that is that if you look at all, there's a very interesting array of things that have been in the course of snake evolution co-opted into venom, including things like bradykinin, as is. So there are some venom genes that are, in fact, single genes, and the physiological function and the venom function are, are encoded by the same locus because they're the identical protein, the one used in normal physiology and the one that the snake injects into its victim. And you think about things like, you know, what are, what are the snakes often doing? They're often screwing up hemostasis or screwing up neurotransmission. And merely the injection of some normal physiological protein into the circulatory system or where it can reach the nervous system can be sufficient to drop things. Uh, there's also all sorts of really interesting anticoagulant and procoagulant uh, components in venoms. Again, all you need to do is get, get the normal physiological protein expressed in the venom gland, and you've got the beginnings uh, of a toxin. So I just want to talk about that early minute. And I think what the cone snails could be doing is just at, at random expressing peptides, you know, short polypeptides um, in their venom, and if those, anything in that works, it's now, the, it's now a, a, a substrate for selection. I want to connect those two dots. I'm sorry, I left you at the microphone for a long time. Did you have a question? No, it was about this sort of how two pathways come together. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. So I had a question about the internal deletions that you see. Yeah. Um, is it, like you said, like a native physio physiological protein can sometimes just be a toxin if it's expressed in the wrong spot. So if you take atom 28 and use it as a toxin, is it toxic? And are these delete, or is it that these deletions are necessary? Uh, experiment has not been done. So we would, if we did the experiment, we'd certainly cut the transmembrane part off. But there's reports in literature, for example, that atom 28 is alternatively spliced. So I also want to raise that for people who are thinking about how this gets started, which is, you know, some of these physiological proteins, there may be multiple forms of them, and maybe the, a secreted form of atom 28 was a, was a good place to start. And I know it's kind of disappointing for me to give you this model and then tell you we haven't done the experiment. But part of this is um, we're just kind of picking our, our, um, our models for doing, because that really requires in vivo work. Like, if I, it's not going to surprise you that a truncated atom 28 will digest every in vitro substrate that I give it, you know fibrinogen and all this kind of stuff. That's, to me, not going to be good enough evidence. So we would have to go into animals and show toxicity in some sort of way. And I think we're gearing to do those experiments with a different family of these two toxins where I think the readout is going to be a lot clearer, where we're going to, we're going to find out whether the native physiological protein is disruptive to the, you know, the potential prey and what, what modifications were necessary. So we're just picking our spot for where we're going to invest in the in vivo work and just decided not to do it with either of these two toxin families. Thanks. Okay? But we're on the precipice of doing that with some wicked cool toxins. So thanks for asking. Hi, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, when you talked about the Drosophila ADH genes and then concluded that the duplication was for selection dosage, I know males tend to compensate for having one X chromosome in Drosophila. Did you look at how the females and the male Drosophila um, ADH mutants reacted to alcohol treatment or different alcohol environment? Yeah, so we're putting the, AD the ADH gene is, a, is an autosomal gene. And so we're putting it on an autosome. So there's not going to, there, this is, we're, we're making the animals diploid, or in the case of the duplicate, essentially, you know, tetraploid. So did not look at any uh, male, male, female differences. Um, I've got a, God, the data, I got a, it's, it's good for you to ask anyway, because the, you know, the, the test for, and David did all sorts of experiments, including in vivo testing the flies for 
alcohol resistance, which is a straightforward assay. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, the internal, the anatomy of males and females are not necessarily the same. And I'm, it's, I'm just not, it's, the light bulb's not going off that males and females showed any difference in those assays in terms of alcohol susceptibility. Because um, I don't remember that. We probably did them all on one sex just to control for that, but I don't know that we actually explored any sex differences. Do you speculate that someone else might be curious, like the effect we see with male mice and female mice, in, in your case, Drosophila females versus males? I mean, I could expect there would be differences simply because the, 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 um, where these enzymes are expressed, may be, there may be sexually dimorphic places, for example, in the gut. Um, there may be also a little differences in feeding behavior and things like that. So uh, I think it's something to be alert to from sort of the, the natural situation. But I don't think we had any evidence that there was a male-female difference. So I think you've got to keep these things in. It's a great question. Thank I you. think it's like keep these things in mind because you can see the hesitation in the question. I started to think, gosh, I hope we controlled for that. But no, I, 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 I have faith that David controlled for that. Yeah. Hi. So um, thanks for the wonderful talk. I also really appreciated the, the general rules. And in that context, so I guess I was wondering, you talked about how for many genes, duplication might be a, a, not a good route to go, it might be deleterious, and that regulatory genes and uh, structural genes have, might, might place different demands or bring different constraints. So how is something like whole genome duplication possible? How, why does, how can that even happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and and uh, we, can all have, we can all bat that around, because I, I have probably no better answer than anyone else. The only thing is, whole, the, the, at the initiation of whole genome duplication, of course, there's lots of weird things, too. There's, I mean, there's tetrapoidization, and you know, anybody here is a xenopus researcher, et cetera. So we know that ploidy can increase. But of course, the ratio between all the regulatory products and targets would be still the same initially, right? And everyone here working on Tilios fish knows that there was another du duplication there that all your zebrafish have got more Hox complexes than I showed, right? Um, and subsequent to those uh, um, polyploidization events, there's some sorting out. So whether it's the yeast genome-wide duplications or whether it's the Tilios du duplication, um, we see there then can be some gene loss after that. So it would seem like initially, and of course, and I'm only talking about ant, oh well, I just talked about yeast, so I apologize for that. I'm not talking at all about plants, because of course there's a lot of ploidy going on in plants. I'm, I'm just gonna stick to animals a little bit where you know, we'll talk about these regulatory networks and these kind of genes, because obviously plants seem to be a lot more tolerant of these dosage changes. Um, but I, the only thing I just say in terms of animals um, dealing with polyploidization is initially all the ratios are the same. And then maybe you have gene loss after that of the things that can be lost um, without disrupting those balances. That's, that's the best ad hoc explanation I can come up with. Just and I, I should mention that, you know, things like for people in the audience, and, and maybe you all know some data or maybe you've done these kinds of experiments, but when I'm referring to, for example, third copy, like one of the ex early days there was a lot of manipulating Hox genes and, and, and other regulators. And you know, things like a third copy of PAC-6 causes a lot of defects. A, a wild type copy of PAC-6, you know, a nice, a nice wild type gene. I think those are the things we should be thinking about. And I think, of course, and here I am at NIH and we were talking about you know, genetic um, conditions, I think we got to understand that there may be consequences to uh, you know, segmental aneuploidy and things like this that are simply due to extra wild type copies of regulatory genes that these be manifest in human conditions. I don't think there's been enough, I don't think there's been a lot of uh, discussion about that in the literature. We're out of time, but thanks, and it might take a few questions uh, afterwards. Uh, one more round of applause, please. Thanks, John.